What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Algebra 2 instruction lesson here with Mr. Gaines as we continue our work with one-to-one -one and inverse functions. Today, we are going to focus on algebraic processes to find and confirm that we have inverse functions and taking a look at how to restrict the domain of a function to make sure that its inverse is also a function. So let's just jump right into some example problems. So if you're following along in your notes, we are working here on problem number seven, where we are asked to algebraically find the inverse function for each of the following functions that are given. Um, let's just say find the inverse, inverse of the function. There we go. Because in some cases, the inverse is a function. Well, sometimes it's not. So algebraically find the inverse of each of the following functions. So to find an inverse, we want to go back to the idea of the definition or the concept of inverse function. Inverse functions take the domain and range of a function and invert them. They switch the domain with the range. So what we can do here is we can essentially take a look at this as an equation. So let's look at 7a instead of as a function, let's write it as an equation. So the y equals the cube root of x plus 5. Now, if I want to find the inverse, what the inverse does is takes the x and the y coordinates and switches them. So I'm going to change y to x, and now I would have the cube root of y plus 5. In order to write the inverse function then, if I wanted in the similar notation, a similar expression, I'm going to go ahead and get y by itself. So if I need to move the cube root here to the other side in order to get y by itself, I'm going to cube both sides. So this would leave me with x cubed equal to y plus 5. And now I can get y by itself by subtracting. So x cubed minus 5 is equal to y. So the inverse of f of x, this would be the correct notation here, is x cubed minus 5. And if we want to check that graphically, we can do so. So what I can do here is I can take a look on a graph. I can go to y equals and enter the original equation, which was the cubed root. You can find that under the math button of x plus 5, and now our new function, x cubed minus 5. And in graphing these, these should be a reflection across the line y equals x. And there it may be a little bit difficult to see, but it is, but it is a reflection across the line y equals x. Let me go ahead and put that line in there. So we can see there that it is a reflection across the line y equals x. These are inverses. I could also take a look at the table and start to compare some of the opposite values. So um, here for y2, I have the point 2, 3, which on y1 should be 3, 2. Here I have a point 0, negative 5 on y2, which should be negative 5, 0 on y1, and we see that. So we can compare some of the points as well. Uh, that's not quite an exhaustive list, but it gives us a good idea of whether this is going to be an inverse function or not. So you can look at it graphically to get a visual representation, a reflection across y equals x. Uh, we can look at the table. I'm also going to show you in a little bit a way to verify that algebraically. Now let's go ahead and take a look at another example. So let's take a look at b. In b, I want to find the inverse of g of x. So again, I want to replace the y value. So let's say g of x is a y value. I want to replace it with x. I want to replace the x values with y. Now I need to get y by itself. So in order to get y by itself here, I need to get y out of the denominator. So I'm actually going to multiply by y plus 1. So this would give me x times y plus 1 equal to 2y. 
to multiply both sides by one y plus one. Now I can uh, I can do a process of distribution here to get x times y plus x equal to two y. I'm going to get the two values of y on the same side, so I'm going to subtract two y. So now I have x y minus two y. I'm also going to subtract x over to the other side. Now the next step. I can combine these two values by taking a look at a GCF. Both of these two terms have the GCF Y. So I can factor out a Y. And this gives me a single representation of one variable of Y, which now I can get by itself by dividing by X minus 2. So Y is equal to negative X over X minus 2. So the this would be the inverse of g of x is negative x over x minus 2. And again, you could check that graphically if you'd like. Let's take a look at one more example here. In example uh, c, again, h of x is currently my y value, so I'm going to replace that with x. x I'm going to replace with y. And then I'm going to work to get y by itself. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and follow reverse order of operations. I'm going to add 2 to both sides. And now, to get rid of the Q by Y, I would cube root both sides. So the inverse of H of X is the cube root of X plus 2. Now, not all of these inverses are going to be functions. It's not necessarily the, uh, that each function has an inverse that is also a function. In order for that to be the case, the function would have to be one to one. In these examples, yes, each of the given functions are one to one functions. Oh, actually, sorry, two of the three given functions are one to one. Let me double check the other one. Let me be accurate there. Yes, all of the functions here are one-to-one, -one, and so all of their inverses would be functions. However, let's say I gave you the function, uh, let's say just, we won't do the full work here, but let's say uh, t of x was x squared. This is a parabola, so it does have an inverse. Its inverse, if we went through the process, would be the square root of x plus or minus the square root of x which would create a horizontal parabola, which would not be an inverse, or would not be a function. So all functions have inverse equations. In order for those equations to be inverses, or sorry, in order for those inverses to be functions as well, the first original function must be one-to-one. -one. Each of these functions are one-to-one, -one, so their inverses are one-to-one. -one. And D, that I just jotted down here real quick, the original function is not one-to-one, -one, so its inverse is an equation, but not a function. Now, with A, B, and C, let's go through an algebraic process of verifying that these functions are, or that these inverses are truly inverses of one another. So if you remember back to uh, the last notes video, we did some function composition with some equations. And basically what we're going to find here is... If I take f of the inverse of f of x, and I compose those, the result is going to be just x. So inverse operations undo each other. This is the purpose of solving, this is the process of solving equations that we deal with on a frequent basis. That any inverse operation will undo it, it's each other, leaving us behind whatever was there before, in this case, x. So if we want to verify algebraically, let's say in problem A, that f of x and the inverse of f of x are truly inverses, we're going to do a function composition. And it doesn't matter which order you do the fun function composition. So in this case, I'm going to substitute the inverse into the original function. So if I take x cubed minus 5, and I substitute that into f of x, I compose that with f of x, this would be the cubed root of replacing 
this x value with x cubed minus 5, and then maintaining positive 5 in the root, I would be able to simplify this. This would be the cubed root of x cubed, which would leave me with just x. And this is what we want. So we can see here that these two inverses, uh, these two functions when composed, undo each other's operations. So they are inverses. So this gives us another way to check it as well. We can check inverses algebraically as well as graphically. Let's take a look at another example. In example B, I'm going to take g of x and substitute that into the inverse of g of x. So I'm going to kind of reverse the order here. So I'm going to take, again, g of x, which is 2x over x plus 1, and substitute that into g of x. So in the numerator, I would have a negative 2x over x plus 1. In the denominator, I'd have 2x over x plus 1 minus 2. This is a complex fraction, and so I can simplify this. If I multiply 2 by x plus 1 over x plus 1, this would eliminate all denominators within this complex fraction, leaving you with negative 2x in the numerator and 2x minus 2x minus 2 in the denominator. So this would simplify to negative 2x over the 2x's in the denominator would subtract out negative 2, and the negative 2's would divide out to give me just x. So we can see here I changed the order of the function composition, but if you compose a function and its inverse, the result will just be the variable. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can verify that in C, the original function h of x and the inverse of h of x are truly inverses of one another. Hopefully you got a chance to work through C, and hopefully you did the process of function composition. Now again, you may have done this a little bit differently. You may have done your order a little bit different. Let's see if we can follow along here. So I'm going to take the inverse and substitute it into the original function. So this would be the cubed root of x plus 2, substituted in for x, which is being cubed, and then subtracted by 2. So the cubed root and the cubed function will undo each other, leaving me with x plus 2. And I still have that minus 2 that we have not altered. So x plus 2 minus 2 would be just x. So in this instance, we have first found functions that are inverses of one another, and then verified that they are inverses algebraically by showing that through composition, the two functions undo each other's operations. So this is just an algebraic way for us to find these inverses and to confirm that they are inverses. Now, as I mentioned before, that some of the functions or some functions have inverses that are functions, while others have inverses that are not functions. So let's go ahead and take a look at problem number nine. Problem number nine says a table of values for the simple quadratic function y f of x equals x squared is given below along with its graph. Graph the inverse by switching the ordered pairs. So if I wanted to graph this inverse equation, negative 2, 4 would now become 4, negative 2, which I can graph. Negative 1. 1 would become now positive 1, negative 1, which I can graph. 0, 0 would remain at 0, 0 as we switch x and y values. 1, 1 would remain at 1, 1 as we switch x and y values. And 2, 4 would become 4, 2. And so we can kind of see the shape of this graph taking place. And we could draw or sketch this graph in. So it would look something like this. And so the, the question B says, compare the two graphs. What do you notice? Well, we may notice that they maintain the shape. We also may notice that this is a reflection across the line y equals x. We also may notice that the inverse of f of x is not a function because it would not pass the vertical line test. So there's a variety of things that we may see here in the picture. Now, problem number 10 says, 
Given f of x equals x minus 4 squared, restrict the domain to create a one-to-one -one function. Then find the inverse of f of x, and let's say such that it is a function. So I can create an inverse equation for f of x, but let's say I want an inverse function. So in order to come up with an inverse function again, the graph must be one-to-one. -one. So let me go to my graphing calculator here, and let me show you that the graph for x minus 4 quantity squared. And most of you probably know what this graph looks like. Let's go ahead and just get that down. Type this incorrectly, sorry. So here is that function. It's a horizontal shift to the right of the graph we saw above. So if I were to sketch this out, the reason that this is not a going to be a, or have an inverse that is a function is because it is not one to one. So what we can do is we can restrict the domain of f of x to create a picture or a function that is one to one. In order to be one to one, every x value must map to one y, which is true here, but every y value must map, map to one x, which is not true. But what I could do here is if I eliminated the left side of this curve, so I'll draw it in in a little bit of a dotted line, it, were, it exists as part of the original function, but we're going to eliminate the domain or restrict the domain so that I have a one-to-one -one graph here. So let's say in this case, x is going to be greater than or equal to 4. If x is greater than or equal to 4, then I have a function that x, every x maps to 1y and every y maps to 1x, which would be, again, 1 to 1. So the domain of this function would be x is greater than or equal to 4. The range of this function would be that y is greater than or equal to 0. This is f of x. So it has a domain restriction, which doesn't change the range in this case. What it does is change the inverse so that the inverse is going to be a function. So if I'm dealing with... Um, let me move some of this stuff. Let me move this over here. So let's say again, f of x equals, say f of x equals the um, x minus 4 quantity squared, where x is greater than 4. Then the inverse can be found, again, by switching x values with y values. Sorry, so I would have x equals y minus 4 quantity squared. And then I would solve for y. So and I would square root both sides. Now, usually, when we square root both sides, we are creating a square root, so we take plus or minus. In this case, because x can only be greater than 4, only positive values would satisfy this equation. So I don't need the plus or minus. I'm just going to deal with positive cases here. So now I can get y by itself by adding 4 to both sides. So I have the square root of x plus 4 equals y. And so then in this case, the inverse of f of x will be a function if the square root of x plus 4 is its result. And so I can see that if I type that into my graphing calculator here. The square root of x plus 4 is a function. It would look something along the lines of this on our graph. So the domain of the inverse of f of x, the domain would be the range value previously given. x is greater than or equal to 0. The range value would be the domain previously given. y is greater than or equal to 4. So what this allows us to do is to create scenarios when, where instead of an inverse equation, we want an inverse function. So if our original function is not one-to-one, -one, like f of x was not originally 
one to one because it was a full parabola, we can restrict the domain, essentially in this case, focus on half of the function, creating a one to one function that I can then create an inverse of that will also be a function. Okay. This is uh, usually a little bit more advanced concept that you focus a little more on pre in pre-calculus, but I wanted to make sure that we touched on this topic. And this looks like a great place for us to stop. In the next lesson, we'll take a look at applications of inverse and one-to-one -one functions. As always, thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.